I'm a science communicator. My job throughout the week is to explain the mysteries and functioning of the world that we live in and to explain the processes of science that we've used to develop this knowledge. Now, I'm saying this because I'm about to commit a cardinal sin in the world of science. I'm about to break one of the fundamental rules. You see, we live in a world in need of solutions. How do we live sustainably? How do we live lives of meaning? How do we decarbonize our economy? In the world of science, too often the answer is more research. Too often the answer is, yes, yes, we know most of what the problem is, and we've got a pretty good solution, but just wait a little bit more. Wait a little bit more. We just need to know that bit more before we take action. Now, I'm about to reject this. As a science communicator, I'm rejecting this fundamental principle. This is a 52-watt solar panel. It's old and inefficient by today's standards. It's actually, it's actually a tiny solar panel. It's probably about 1 60th of what you might see on your neighbor's roof. But it works. It's boring, but it's practical. It's useful. In fact, if you whack that up on your roof here in Canberra, we know ex pretty much exactly what that's going to generate in terms of energy over the 25-year lifetime that its manufacturers guarantee. For the numbers people out there in the audience, and I know there are some of you, it's 5.265 gigajoules. Okay, not very many of you. Now, for people who like to visualize things a little bit more, I thought I'd actually turn to something that's equivalent in energy. Um, and so perhaps look at some of the traditional sources of fuel that we get our energy from. Now, to do this, I looked at black coal, traditional energy source here in Australia. 5.265 gigajoules, when we take the efficiency losses of both the power plant and the solar panel into account, comes to about 566 kilos of black coal. Now, could I borrow two volunteers, any two volunteers, perhaps Hannah and Grace up the front here? <laughs> now, I took a trip out to the Canberra um, Heritage Railway, and I couldn't get, well, I could get 566 kilos of black coal, but unfortunately, 566 kilos would take an awful long time for Hannah and Grace to move across the stage. This is 56 kilos, just a tenth of what that solar panel represents, equivalence. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of breaking some TED rules here and pull out a Stanley knife, so please excuse me for a second. And I thought people might like to actually look at some black coal. So would you like to just pass that around? I'm sorry, that, that's <laughs> filthy. Sorry. Uh, Janie, sorry, I borrowed an old tea towel from home. Pass it around if you'd like some wet wipes. Um, oh, I talked to a mining um, uh, occupational health and safety person in chemistry. Um, they said, uh, make sure you don't lick it, otherwise it's safe. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. Equivalent energy sources. This solar panel is old and inefficient. Now, if we were to go back in time, if we should go back to 1977, who can have a guess at how much this, this solar panel might cost? I'm here in salesman mode now. I'm going to do you a deal. $3,999. 13 years later, in 1990, $399. What a bargain. One more. Let's, go, let's see how much it is now. $39. Since the movie Star Wars was released in 1977, graphing software doesn't want to show 1977, we've gone from $77 per watt to just 77 cents. Now, for those of you who are thinking, well, all of that magical drop in the cost of solar power power happened just between the release of Star Wars and the release of Return of the Jedi. 
we can zoom in a little bit more, just on these last few years from, I can't remember what year, A New Hope was released. Not A New Hope, Phantom Menace. Everyone wants to forget the Phantom Menace. The drop is continuing. 2008, the price was about $4 per watt. The price now is under a dollar per watt, about 77 cents. The important thing is, while this solar panel has continued to drop in price over the same period, the traditional sources of power have crept up, have crept up. We're now at or approaching a stage of grid parity, a stage at which the cost of providing our, our energy in renewable ways is getting cheaper than the competitive grid price. Now, this of course depends on two big things. For solar, it depends on how much sunlight you're going to get, and it depends on the competing sources of power. But there are places around the world, California is a great example, where it is now cheaper to provide fuel by solar power than the competing sources of, of energy from the traditional sources. This is an important thing, and it's a very important thing for solving the problem of decarbonizing our society. So, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we decarbonizing our society? Well, this is the problem that I'm here to talk about. I've said before that, I said at the beginning, that we don't need to do more research. My argument here is that technologies we need to decarbonize our, our world are sitting right there on the shelf. We just need to take them down and put them in the ground in the right way. I'm here to talk about the problems that are causing that and then what we can do to fix it. So, why is it that we're still burning millions and millions of these bags of coal every single day in Australia? Why aren't we moving to a renewable world that we need to see, that we all agree we need to see? There's a whole variety of reasons for this. I'm sure many of you have got many of them in your head right now, and if I don't say the right ones, you're probably thinking, hey, you've missed out on this one, that one, the other. There's lots of reasons, but two very important ones. The first is that we're locked into a whole array of path dependency with our traditional sources of fuel. It's far cheaper, far cheaper, to get your three monthly power bill than it is to put up all the money you need to install an array of solar panels on your roof. Far cheaper. Just think about the difference in cost. A few hundred dollars versus a few thousand dollars. The other problem is that the solar that we are installing, and in Australia last year we installed something like two gigawatts of solar panels, is largely on our roofs. And this is excellent, but it's in a closed loop. This means that people install solar panels on their roofs, they make carbon savings, they make savings on their, on their fuel bill, but then those savings go into buying speedboats or something else, whatever you might want to do, but they don't continue on making a cycle of decarbonizing Australia. We need to move to a world where, where the fuel sources are making the world cheaper. So the point here is that grid parity, grid parity is an important moment in time because it means that not only is the solar panel cheaper from an environmental perspective, not only have we, recognizing the environmental perspective, long overvalued the traditional sources of fuel and undervalued the carbon neutral alternative, but actually from the perspective of your wallet, from the cost of simply adding up what is the cheaper fuel source. So we need to new move to a new world. We need to move to new ways of financing our decarbonized world. But we all know this isn't going to happen via business as usual. Or perhaps turn that around, perhaps via the usual ways of business. I'm going to raise a suggestion in the next few minutes that I think is a way that we can start moving to a decarbonized Australia. I'm going to ask for your help at the end, and if people have suggestions, please let me know where we can go to help decarbonize Australia. The major part of this comes from ideas in the, in the rapidly growing world of crowdfunding. Now, crowdfunding, as I'll tell you in a minute, can't solve our problems, but we can use some of the lessons from crowdfunding to think about crowd investing our way to decarbonize Australia. So what's crowdfunding? Well, to just give a little bit of a background, 
Last year, uh, some colleagues and I were in the state process of making a documentary about the communication of complex scientific information. We'd done most of the production work for this documentary, but we'd reached an impasse at the very end where we just needed $10,000 to finish off the editing, to commission a couple of animations, to do the kind of final tying, dotting the I's and crossing the T's that you need to make a production-ready uh, movie. Now, the traditional sources of funding were available to us, but they were slow. We had to jump a few hur hurdles. We had to fit into other people's boundaries. Instead, we decided to go, as many people have done recently, onto a crowd crowdfunding website and ask for the money. We put up a pitch. We put up a pitch and we said, look, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to make. If you believe in us, then consider donating. In return for donations, we offered people small things. Uh, we offered people their names in the credits, or perhaps we offered them tickets to the premiere. Uh, one um, enterprising gentleman actually said that uh, for a, a decent sum of money, he'd be like to be listed as the associate Jedi for this production. So <laughs> we've got that. We raised the money. We're hoping to release in a month or so. Now, I said before, we can't crowdfund our way out of climate change. We can't crowdfund our way out of the problems of the entire economy. The numbers are just too big. There's never going to be an associate Jedi of climate change. Some rich man who comes along, rich man or woman, comes along and says, I have the money to solve climate change. It's just not going to happen. But we can take some lessons from this and employ them for crowd investing. So what can we learn? Well, there's three key lessons that I want to talk about that I learned from crowdfunding, and I know that other people are learning these same sorts of things. The first thing is that cr the long tail is crucial. We were funded not just by the big fish, by the associate Jedi who put in multi-thousand dollar contributions. We were funded also by the five and ten and twenty dollar contributions. These are just as valuable, but they're ignored in traditional investing regimes. The transaction costs are just too great. The second th thing we learnt is that small commitments, the five dollars, point the way to larger commitments later. Now, this is an interesting fact. It was, it was shown masterfully by the Obama re-election cam campaign recently. They asked for small commitments from uh, various interested people. Perhaps you'll put a, uh, a sticker in your front window. Just a small sticker, that's fine. Made them far more likely down the track to putting a large po poster in their lawn. You open the boundary, you grease the wheels for allowing people to commit to a project. The final thing, uh, that we learned from this process is that networking is absolutely central. Not only did the people who, com who donated and contributed to our project provide money, they also provided the massively important thing of social endorsement, saying that this is a project worth investing, both amongst their physical friends and out there on Facebook and Twitter. We weren't just talking with individuals, we were talking with entire communities. I think we can employ these lessons to reform our modes of investing in decarbonized economy. I think we can use a crowd investing model to get rid of our carbonized economy. So how do we do this? Well, here's my proposal. I say that we go out there and crowdfund, like on the street and on the net, like Green, Greenpeace and Amnesty and the crowdfunders do. We call for donations and we use, sorry, investments, and we use those investments to build solar farms. Now, unlike the solar panels you put on your roof, all of the return continues on and on to grow those solar farms. All of the money collected together, we grow those solar farms as quickly as we can. Now, here's the trick. When a point is reached, when those solar farms have reached a certain point, we transform that social justice enterprise, environmental enterprise, into a return-paying business. We transform into a company that pays a return back to the investors. Now, I think the proper trigger would be when Australia gets off the coal. I think this is a model that we can use. We can use to start building the renewable futures we need, a model to start doing what we need to do. Now, there are glitches, there are issues. Critical in this is the fact that Concepts like this don't easily fit into traditional investing structures. 
There's many details to be worked out. These are the problems of startups. They need to happen. There's other problems that people talk about in terms of renewables, such as baseload power and how do you provide power at night time. But these are the problems for the decades to come. They aren't reasons to stop now. Regular followers of the TED experience might recently have seen a talk by Amanda Palmer, acclaimed singer and songwriter. Now, Amanda's talk was fascinating. She said, the problem with the modern music industry is not how do we make people pay for music, but how do we let them? I think that the same sentiments can be applied to decarbonizing our economy. Not how do we make people do the right thing on carbon, but how do we let them? I think that this is a way. Thank you.